please welcome to Radnor Memorial Library, Mary M. Lane. Apologies, our PowerPoint isn't working today. Um, but no. never to fear, I will um, direct you to direct the correct uh, images, and if you want to write them down, that's fine. Um, so uh, I'm definitely not one to brag about myself, but uh, the New York Times uh, gave a positive review, calling uh, my book a scrupulous account of Hitler's abiding obsession with art and Germany's cultural patrimony, a convincing full-throated case for the German government to amend its laws and practices regarding legal property. Uh, apparently, the only thing Ben Shapiro and the New York Times can agree on is my book. Uh, ben Shapiro called uh, the book an excellent book. It really is a fascinating story of how well uh, history plays into modern politics. While well, worth the read, Mary is a terrific reporter. Um, Kyrgyz said a gripping original contribution to still unresolved Nazi crime. Um, but lest you be uh, dealing with just one side of the story, um, I did get these uh, two uh, far right. Um, a neo-Nazi Holocausting denier um, people. Um, so Charles B. I do know his last name, but he is a far-right voice on Twitter, Twitter, said, this writer is a lying, disingenuous, garbage political hack. He <laughs> doesn't give a rip about the actual history. You're a disgrace. And Carolyn, uh, who's a well-known um, Holocaust denier, said, Lane tries to take the moral high ground. That is an old Jewish tactic. Worries? Who would worry except those who are convinced Jews should own all German property? So thanks, Carolyn and Charles, and I'm glad you enjoyed the book. Um, so my book, uh, sorry that we don't have images, but actually I agree with uh, General Mattis that PowerPoint is so stupid. Um, but uh, my book started out, as we discussed in the foreword, um, I was uh, in New York around November 9th um, at 2013 at 4 a.m. And an editor called me on one of my phones for the Wall Street Journal. I was the chief European art reporter. Um, and I was 27. And my editor said, you need to get back to Berlin immediately. Like, there's been a case. Um, the son of a Nazi art dealer has uh, been discovered to have 1,300 books of art in his apartment. And uh, this is crazy. And we need you to just you know, like investigate this. And this was during auction week in New York, which is a time when about $100 million to $130 million <laughs> Uh, of art is sold in the time it takes to watch a feature film. So I was a bit skeptical, it was also 4am, and uh, said, are you sure? You know, and I was told I had 72 hours to go back to Berlin and write a story about this, this case. So it was very clear that this was something I needed to deal with. Um, so I flew from JFK uh, back to Berlin and unfolded this story that essentially took over my life for the next year. Um, we had uh, six plus stories uh, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, which was unprecedented uh, for our coverage uh, at the journal. And really, as someone who speaks fluent German and was educated in Germany, it, it made me really have to think about, you know, I am very against bashing Germany over the head for every little anti-Semitic thing that happens in the world. But at the same time, this was something that really needed to be dealt with. And there was a legal, there were clear legal problems with the situation. So the apartment where these 1,300 works were found, and they were by Matisse, Manet, Monet, Rodin, Renoir, you know, people we all know, as well as many German artists whose careers have been repressed. Um, under German law, the Verjährungsfrist, uh, which is the statute of limitations, uh, to get these works back had, had expired in the 1970s. And most American, sorry, not American, most countries that are, have been involved in the war 
have amended their statutes of limitations for stolen property to say that if a work is acquired under bad faith uh, from someone and that happened between 1933 and 1945 and that was a person that could reasonably be considered to be um, a victim of Nazi looted art, that that work would not have a statute of limitations if you could prove that it was your work. So it was a very unique legalistic position to be in for Germany. And I immediately contacted the German authorities and gave them the benefit of the doubt. And it was clear that they had confiscated these works because they felt that Cornelius Scarlett, the son of the major dealer of Hitler, Hildebrand, um, was not paying his taxes. And they felt that this was a pure tax issue and had nothing to do with the statute of limitations. And it was further, I don't know how many of you are lawyers in this room, but uh, it was further complicated by the fact that Germany had signed a non-binding legal agreement in 1998 called the Washington Principles, in which they said that they would amend their statute of limitations, they would amend um, the accountability of people who stole art from people during World War II. And they had not actually codified that. They hadn't put it into law. And this was a massive public relations problem for Angela Merkel, who was the chancellor of Germany, and for many people. So I reported on the story uh, and then was headhunted um, by a major publishing house here in America to write an, a book about it. And Unfortunately, the journal doesn't really give book leave anymore. Um, so I was forced between my permanent contract with the journal and uh, writing a book, and I chose the book. Uh, and German legal law, uh, which is a very intimidating topic. Um, so what you would be seeing right now, in theory, um, is that I, I was very surprised in my five-year journey of of working on the book. Okay, who is Hildebrand Gerlitt, the guy that worked for Hitler? Hitler had a Fuhrer Museum project, which was a secret project in which about five to ten, um, depending on how you want to count them, art dealers were working for him to confiscate art that he considered degenerate. Now, degenerate art wasn't just art by Nazis, or sorry, by for you, uh, it wasn't just art by Jewish Europeans. It was art that Jewish Europeans supported. It was art that depicted women or minorities or people on the gender spectrum in favorable lights. It was art that um, depicted uh, pretty much any sense of, of gender freedom, of ethnic freedom. So say you just show a woman that's not from your culture, or not from a German culture, and you show her as a human that's degenerate, even if you, yourself, fall under what Hitler considered the approved heteronormic spectrum. Um, and Hildebrand Gerlitt, who is the man that uh, collected a lot of this art, he collected art that Hitler approved and passed on to Hitler, but he also collected confiscated art that Hitler would not have approved of and kept it for himself. So. Some of the slides you would have in theory have been seeing tonight. Um, there was one work by Max Beckman, who's a wonderful artist, uh, and it just showed a, a black waiter and a white, cute uh, girl on the beach just interacting normally. That is considered taboo because Hitler felt that these you know, two different races, in quotes, um, should not be interacting, that they shouldn't be having a pleasant conversation. Um, Beckman also created a woman called Woman in Cloche Hat, um, which showed an elderly woman looking feisty and fun. Um, aging was not appreciated in Hitler's regime. Um, it was seen as a sign of the decline of fertility in women. Um, so that's another no-no. Um, uh, another work in the girl collection was Katie Kolbitz's Lamentation for the Dead. Now, Katie Kolbitz uh, is a fascinating figure because during the Weimar Republic, uh, a lot of us, as a lot of us know, if anyone's seen Liza Minnelli's cabaret, it was a time of vibrant sexuality among women in their 30s, their 20s. 
But it was also a time of incredible pain for women in their 40s and their 50s because a lot of their sons would be killed in the Great War, um, which was seen as needless war, much as many people nowadays see you know, the war in Afghanistan, <coughs> the war in Iraq. Uh, Katie had actually uh, been asked by her son Peter to um, sign the permission papers for Peter to go to the Great War. And um, her husband and she signed it, which helped uh, him get drafted. And then he died within two weeks mm -hmm. or three weeks. So she felt this incredible pain. And so she created these works after the First World War that showed the pain of mother. It wasn't necessarily protesting all wars, but it was showing the pain that, that parents deal with when their children die in wars, um, which did not sit well with Hitler. Um, she was an incredibly talented draftsman um, to the point where Kaiser Wilhelm wanted her work uh, taken out of an exhibition, actually, because it was getting so much recognition and he felt that women shouldn't get recognition <coughs> as artists. Um, so that's in the Girl in Collection. Um, so is, are a lot of uh, different conflicting portrayals of sexuality for women. So Otto Dix's Leonie, um, which you can easily Google, uh, was another work in Girls Collection and it showed uh, the harrowing trauma of sex work for some women. Um, but then there were other works in the collection, such as Kirchner's Two Lovers, um, that showed how sex work could be freeing for a lot of women and that they really enjoyed it. Um, that, so those were all works that were in the Girl Collection that were found um, recently. Uh, anyway, the, the, the point is that um, there were two conflicting, I'll get into what, exactly what the Girl Collection is in a second, but there were two conflicting artists um, I was hoping to show you today that are in my book that I find very fascinating because living between America and Germany, a lot of people say to me, okay, well, somebody wouldn't want to, they wouldn't want to sacrifice their career for the sake of doing what was morally right. And there were definitely artists who put other artists in jeopardy to benefit their careers um, and also to advance their own careers with the Nazis. And one artist we talk about, or I talk about in the book, um, who's also mentioned in a recent article I wrote for Art News, is Emil Nolda. Um, so Emil Nolda created works, uh, I mean, I'm trying to like show you the good type in it, but, uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so Emil Nolda was in a bit of a bind when Hitler came to power, which, uh, to refresh a history lesson, um, he came to power in January 1933, and then he ended up um, fully becoming the Fuhrer in 1934. So a full five years before he ever invaded Poland, because he knew that in order to first capture countries, he needed to capture the culture. Um, that was very important, and he was very shrewd about that. Um, Emil Nolda was an artist who was considerably older than Hitler, about 15 years older, um, which at the time was incredibly important. Um, and Nolda uh, was in a bit of a bind because I try to, I try to like kind of create, essentially, if you think of the iconic rock artist in America, you would think of somebody like, say, Bruce Springsteen, or maybe like more folk music, you would think of James Taylor, right? Like everyone knows these people. Um, in 1919 and 1920, when Hitler was coming to power, the iconic artist was Nolda. He was the guy that everyone thought about. And he had a choice to make in 1933, which was um, coincidentally for him, the 10th anniversary of the Beer Hall Putsch, which was when Hitler was trying to take power in Munich and create the Third Reich. And <coughs> he had the choice as his 10th anniversary was coming up and, and Hitler's public relations team was, was coming you know, to a head. Um, <coughs> coincidentally headed by someone who graduated from Harvard and couldn't share about it. Um, but uh, he, sorry, I hope not. You are accomplished. Um, but he, um, 
he had a choice to either join Hitler's side or protest against it. And he came out with a book. Um, and again, apologies that I'm just like chucking facts at you, but it would make a lot more sense if it was a play. But um, Nolder decided that he wanted to be part of the Hitler regime. It would bring him power, it would bring him fame, it would, you know, bring a catalyst to his stalling career as a middle aged artist. And he essentially uh, wrote a book called Java de Kempfe, which is the plural of Kampf, which is Mein Kampf. Um, and it was excoriating Jews, minorities, women, and he thought it would work, but it didn't. Uh, it backfired, and uh, Goebbels worked with Hitler to persecute Nolde, and Nolde covered it up um, until the end of the war. At the same time, there was an artist uh, who was in roughly comparable um, prestige and age to Nolde, named George Gross. And this artist uh, was creating works that were essentially, sick. I mean, think of um, sort of like New Yorker cartoons. They were sort of satires on the government and things that were happening at the time. So a precursor to everything we know now, Stephen Colbert, Trevor Noah, John <laughs> Oliver, they were those types of works. And they, drew such a tremendous number of followers that even the Quakers here in America, um, who, God bless them, are lovely, but not exactly art, art experts, um, were saying, hey, he's trying to warn us that there might be a Second World War, and we really need to pay attention. Um, but the government at the time in Germany was so mired in dysfunction and, and political infighting that they focused on persecuting people like um, George Gross, uh, instead of actually solving their problems. Um, you're giving me a, I know, yeah, I love, okay, you're gonna be fine. Um, anyway, <laughs> the point being is that um, a lot of people know about the Degenerate Art Exhibition um, that happened in 1937, which again, Hitler prepared for this Degenerate Art Exhibition in 1933, so four years before he actually put it on. And whatever, 1939, six years, I'm very bad at math. Six years before he ever invaded Poland, he put on this exhibition. Um, because he realized that in order to take over countries, you had to first take over your own culture and decide what in your culture is important and what is dangerous, and you need to control that. And so, he put on what many people know now, the Degenerate Art Exhibition was an exhibition excoriating people like Gross, who tried to fight against uh, Hitler. It excoriated people like Nolde, who tried to ingratiate themselves with Hitler. But it had a highest, the highest number of visitors compared to American Museum until uh, the Mona Lisa came to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. So, an insane number of people when you think about the transportation to get to this space. Not everyone had cars like that. Um, but he also put on an exhibition that was less well known of great German art, so art that embodied Aryan ideal, ideals. Um, that was the next slide jumper. Um, this all circles back uh, to my situation in um, 2013 where I got this call to have to write these stories for the Wall Street Journal about Cornelius Gerlitt and Hildebrand Gerlitt. So the father, Hildebrand, who had been working for Hitler, and then the son, Cornelius. Now Hildebrand had been, all of the artists I've just talked about um, are in the 1,300 strong collection that Hildebrand Gerlitt had accumulated. He had accumulated these because he had been one of the five major art dealers for Adolf Hitler and he had gotten that position, um, I didn't really talk about it in the journal articles, but I talk about it a lot in the book, um, he had gotten that position because he had actually been an advocate for female artists, Jewish, Jew, Jew, Jewish artists, um, minority artists, uh, so many different artists that Hitler hated. And Hitler actually had his team come to Hildebrand Gerlitt and say, 
you have a lot of connections with these groups. Um, would you like to use that against them? And Hildebrand did it. And um, that was definitely something very surprising in this research that so many of the people that helped Hitler were people who had connections to minority groups or persecuted groups or potentially persecuted groups and they used those connections against those groups mm. in order to be part of the regime. Mm -hmm. um, Hildebrand uh, did that and he successfully, many of you may have seen uh, the movie Monuments Men, mm -hmm. yes, by Robert, that, Robert Edsel wrote that book, um, a colleague of mine. Um, Hildebrand managed to deceive the monuments men, so he destroyed a lot of what are called the province records, which means that's the documents that show where an artwork has been from the minute it was made to where it is now. And the monuments men were amazing, but they had limited resources, and it is, uh, it, it should be said that in, there is no modern government that is recorded other than the US government that has created a taxpayer funded group to protect the culture of the country as defeated other than the <coughs> So that is actually amazing. Um, but unfortunately, Hildebrand was able to deceive them and convince them that his a lot of his connection, collection, which he hid, was not actually his collection, and he got away with it. Um, he died in the late 1950s in a car crash, and George Gross, uh, whom we just talked about, uh, moved back to Germany shortly thereafter with his wife. His son Marty was a well-known jazz musician in Chicago, and George Gross dealt with PTSD. I mean, keep in mind that it was until the late 1950s that the DSM, the Diagnostic, everyone knows the DSM, okay, great, um, came out and they didn't even diagnose PTSD uh, until the 1980s. So Gross was dealing with that and he died of substance abuse issues in, the, in, the, in 1959. And Nolda died later and their, their stories died with them. Um, but this, the discovery of this collection really brought it to the fore for me. Um, I'm going to try to wrap this up because I feel like I've been talking way too long. Um, the PowerPoint's mm -hmm. helped that. But essentially, um, it's, it's a very difficult story because when this came to the fore in Germany, it came to the fore because Cornelius Gerlitt, the son of the art dealer Hildebrand Gerlitt, was on a high-speed train from Switzerland to Germany, and he was found with 9,000 euros in cash, which is below the legal limit to declare, but it was found in 500 euro banknotes, and if you Googled him as a government official, um, bureaucratically he did not exist, and the German government was very worried. They were saying, okay, here are all these works by Nolde, Gross, Rodin, Matisse, Manet, Monet, how did he get these? And they ultimately decided to investigate it as a tax investigation, ignoring the glaring reality that his father had worked for Hitler and these were stolen. And in 2013, when I wrote my first piece for the journal, the question was obvious of, okay, you might need to investigate him for his tax, you know, evasion or lack thereof, due process. But also, where did he get these works? And the German government essentially said the statute of limitations expired in the 1970s, so that's not our concern. Um, and that brought up a, a massive problem because as of the time of this book coming out, um, there uh, is no actual solution to that of if a future girl it comes out. So only a few families of the 1,300 works have actually been able to get their works back. Um, one is uh, the Rosenberg family, so Dominique Strauss-Kahn was married to one of the members, so she's the IMF head. Um, they were able to get a piece back, and then uh, another piece that got back was by David Torin, who survived not only an uh, attempted deportation to Auschwitz as a child, but also 9-11. Um, and I worked with them, and it took about two years for them to get these works back. Um, and the German government was rather sluggish on this. 
Um, and the book deals with their stories as well. I mean, it, I promise you, it's written in narrative nonfiction. <coughs> it reads like a story, but it's actually true. Um, it's very footnoted. Um, I got a question today. I wrote an, an essay for Time Magazine, and a reader had a question about the stylistic precision of 1936 Italian flags. Um, but this uh, topic is very much still in play and something that is clearly, you know, the, 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 the idea of saying Hitler's lost hostages is essentially shorthand in the Holocaust restitution community for works that, tangible objects that have yet to be returned to their owners. <coughs> <laughs> what, what, what should happen in the interim with 1,300 plus works? Should they just be left in a warehouse somewhere? Should, should they be put on exhibit? I mean, what do you think, having studied this? Well, uh, legally, um, the works, so the last, so the second to last page one piece I did for the journal was about the fact that Cornelius Scarlett, who was the son of the art dealer that worked you know, with Hitler, um, had no obligation to give any works back, um, to, even if you could prove they were yours, even if you could prove they were looted. But due to a Bavarian justice minister, which is essentially the equivalent of an attorney general, um, he had decided to sign an agreement that when he died, which happened a few months later, uh, that these works would all go to a Swiss museum, the Kunstmuseum Bern, and that German taxpayers would fund the investigation of these works, and any works that were seen to be looted would go back to families. In theory, that was a very good, well, it was a bleep you to the German government by Gerlit, obviously, um, but it was also something that in theory should work, but there is no solid dedicated team to researching these works. Ideally, I think not. I mean, not. I, I can get into the legal weeds as much as you want, um, but uh, I wrote my thesis on retroactive confidentiality law in the press in Germany, so uh, I can definitely do that. But um, what I think should happen is um, the work should be more thoroughly investigated, so the Swiss Museum holds them now, and you're sort of in this holding pattern, um, sort of like an airplane that's just circling and never lands. Um, and you've got works that might have been looted, but we don't have documentation. Well, someone needs to go find the documentation. And then you've got other works. The more interesting thing I find is um, you know, and this is just sort of an art history walk thing, is when people tell me, um, or so when people ask me, like, where's the great place to, like, see German art from the 1900s to the 1940s? I always point them to certain museums that are outside of Germany. Um, the Neue Gallery in New York, or there, you know, LACMA over in LA, like, several different museums. And they're always surprised that I don't mention German museums. But that's because these works, thousands, I and mean, not just the girl one, but if you count other works, you're looking at about 30,000 works, um, were taken from muse small museums. So imagine that Bryn Mawr had this museum, and, or when, you know, or wherever, somewhere here on the mainland, had a museum, and you had bought this great piece by George Gross or Neil Nolder or whomever, and you donated it to that museum, and then the government comes in, um, in this theory, you're either marginalized or dead. Um, sorry, but uh, you, want, you lost one. But somebody comes in and takes that piece and then gives it to the government, and then the government, against the museum's will, having stolen it off the walls with armed guards, is chucking it off to another museum. What I would personally like to see is a situation in which many of those small museums in Germany could get their works back. Because 
one of the tragedies of the Weimar Republic was it was one of the best times to be an artist if you were poor, if you were a woman, if you were a minority, <clears throat> if you were a non-binary gender, like it was a great time to be an artist. And your works were in so many different museums because private donors gave it to those museums. And now they're not there. So the fact that those works are now held in people's houses when they were stolen from museums by the Nazis, I think is a great thing. How do you store that many pieces of art in a small <clears throat> urban apartment? Oh, well, Hildegard Girl was very clever. Um, so storing sculptures is probably the most difficult uh, thing to do because they're easily breakable, you can't pull them up, they're really annoying. Um, think about like a table that you can take apart. It's from Ikea versus a table you can't take apart. It's much more difficult log a table. So that's a sculpture. But what Hildebrand did was he trafficked a lot in works on paper, which means that uh, it literally is a piece of paper. I mean, yes, it's worth $20,000, but it's still easy to fold between tissue, acid-free paper, and just like plop it in the box. Um, and even for canvas works, uh, one of the Matisse's that I helped uh, get rest to family um, was he took it off the stretcher, which is the, 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 the wood frame that it's supposed to be on, and he rolled it up and put it in a box of tomatoes, um, which is where I keep my Matisse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so he was very careful to steal works or get works that were looted that were not easy to transport. Um, or sorry, that were easy to transport and were easy to hide. Because that ultimately was his success. And I think if you look at things like, uh, oh, I mean, I guess the easy example is Al Capone getting taken for tax fraud. Mm -hmm. You know, he knew that if he tried to sell a work on the market that was, you know, say 500000 um, so at the Wall Street Journal and New York Times, a, a cheap work of art that you would cover is about three hundred thousand dollars. That's cheap. So if you sell a work, if you sell ten works for thirty thousand dollars, that's going to fly under the radar. Um, so he was really clever being able to do that financially. I felt like you had a question. Uh, I just wondered how after all this time you come across in a collection like that, how do you go about finding the original owners? If they file complaints at the time and you match it to that or like how did I or how do people in general? Just in general. It's um that's one of the things that's tough. Um uh, no one ever likes to say this sentence because it's a really awkward sentence but Hitler did his job really well, so a lot of the times you know who the original owners were, but their entire families were wiped off. So um, there's no one to give back to. Um, that being said, um, the Feierungsfrist, the Statue of Limitations in Germany, you know, as I said with the Matisse and the Lieberman, even when these families come forward and say, oh, this is our work and we have Proof, you know, it's sort of like a VIN number on a car, like they can prove that that's their thing. Um, the German government at the time was still saying, we can't, we can't help you with this because the statute of limitations has passed. With the Matisse, that was particularly awkward, not just because the one of the heirs was, you know, married to an IMF head at the same time as the Euro crisis was going on, but because the family had also uh, had a work stolen out of the same vault in Norway, um, and also a Matisse, and Norway said to the owners, um, you know, if you don't um, give this back, there's nothing we can do, but we can try to work with you, can use some tax credits, or figure out a way for your, mu your museum to like get a comparable work. And that worked. And that, that Norway eventually gave a painting back, and Germany wasn't willing to do that kind of thing. Um, but the reality is, to fully answer your question, um, when you destroy the provenance records, uh, it's very, very difficult to get a work back to someone, particularly if it's a work on paper. 
because there's not going to be a stamp on the back, there's not going to be a number on the back. It's really tough, but I think one of the biggest steps is, as um, this lady mentioned, sort of getting works back to museums from which they were taken, and then also families that do have that information. I mean, imagine if a government just came in and took precious books from this library, and then the next government was like, oh, it was legal to take them. I mean, that's that's part of what the book confronts is the difference between what's legal and what's moral. And that's something that's a very wide-ended mm -hmm. question. I think, Mary, yeah, I'm, I'm picturing you living and writing in Berlin, because you'll be going back there, and that's how you're making a living. But now you're an author. This is your first book. Right. Correct. Okay. So do you expect when you go back, the book just came out in September, so do you expect when you go back that you'll be interviewed by the German press, by what do you expect will happen? What is their interest in this? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, so the book has European release in English starting the 10th of October, um, okay. which is exciting. Um, Will it be translated to the German? I, that is an interesting question. Uh, so in Germany, um, how do I put this down quickly? Um, <laughs> note to self, do not get publisher in trouble. Um, <laughs> For the U.S., for all of its problems, um, we have a pretty broad libel scope on what we can say in print. Mm -hmm. Germany, um, as the lawyers for my book told me, um, in America, you you know there are different tiers, roughly speaking. I'm not a lawyer, but roughly speaking, there are tiers of libel. Um, and if you are a famous figure in America, um, or if you are a public figure, say a head of state, um, you can, courts will tolerate a larger amount of things said about you that might be negative than if you're a private person. Um, However, in Germany, it's actually the opposite. In, in Germany, um, public figures get more protection than private citizens in most written cases. Um, so that does not count for if an item is published outside of Germany and brought to the country, but it does count if the item is published in the country, which I find interesting. Mm -hmm. um, it, 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 that's that's definitely not to you know smear Germany or something. But po po politicians, even if you criticize them for their job, get a level of protection <coughs> as elected officials that is larger than politicians get here compared to normal citizens. Um, that being said, I think there was a second question in there, something about how it would get received over there. I, I, okay, how it get received? I, I was really hesitant to write the book in many ways, I and mean, even to write the articles because I speak fluent German. I, I'm 31. I moved there when I was 20, um, so I've essentially spent my whole adult life in Germany. You there when you were 20. That was the Fulbright. Yeah. Well, no, the Fulbright was 22. And then I moved there when I was 20 to 21 to be a student and work for the AP, writing about prostitutes, which my mother was not thrilled about. <laughs> um, but uh, they essentially, um, it's, Germany is a great country. There are a lot of amazing things about Germany um, that I love. And there are a lot of amazing things I love about America. So I, I remember when my editor called me, and at, at the 4 a.m. phone call, and was like, "Oh, we brought like a Nazi bleep up." Um, I was like, "Oh crap!" Like partially because I was like, "I have to find a flight in the next three hours," but partially because I was saying, 
I love this country. Like I feel, if you read my epilogue, um, I write about how I feel more patriotic for Germany than many Germans do themselves. Um, and I didn't, like, one of the most heartbreaking things about living in Germany is that I feel very proud that Germany is a great country and that it's a great ally to the United States. Uh, but Germans don't feel that way. Um, ich bin stolz darauf, Deutsch zu sein. Is like how you would say, I'm proud to be German, and they don't want to say it. They, they'll say something like, I'm fortunate that I happen to have the opportunity to be born in this country. I mean, they literally sound like seven year old, like, lawyers. <laughs> but, um, I, yeah, to answer your question about that, how it's received there with awkwardness, I mean, I have a lot of really great German friends. Um, I, when I lived in, you know, like living in Germany, I, I don't, it was very, it's very difficult for me to be friends with anyone who doesn't speak German because the two languages are so intertwined. But I, the, I feel incredibly patriotic about Germany and then at the same time very frustrated that this is not an issue that has been addressed. Mm -hmm. I know why. I mean, that would take a very long time to explain, but, um, that is you have a two-minute version of it? Two-minute version of why it's not being addressed. Yes. Um, or five. Okay. Um, I would say, uh, broadly, culturally speaking, um, Germans... The good thing about Germany and the bad thing about Germany, and the good thing about America and the bad thing about America, is this idea of what's moral versus what's legal. So Americans often tend to say, okay, well, something isn't necessarily legal, but it's immoral, so we're going to protest it, which has its merits, right? And then Germany will often say, okay, maybe this isn't the right thing to do, but it's legal, so what can we do about it? And that also has its merits. It creates a system of order, but it also creates a system where change might not necessarily happen. So... One thing we discuss, or I discuss, in the book is um, the Bavarian justice minister. So Bavaria is where the Gerlitz situation played out. It's a state province, technically, but state. And their justice minister, so that's equivalent of like an attorney general, and Bavaria is a massive, massive province. So very important. It would be like, say, the New York attorney general. You know, it matters a lot. Um, he called me and he, he said, you know, what is, he, we had this conversation and it was on background, so he allowed it to the book, but anyway, he called me and he said, while this was all unfolding in, in 2013, 2014, and he said, okay, try to help me understand why America and Israel is so upset about this. And he's, you know, he said this, you know, we, we confiscated these artworks from this apartment and this is the son of a Nazi art dealer, and they might be not to to art, but we confiscated them to investigate for taxes. And I said, imagine if you're, you know, I mean, obviously you're the attorney general, so you're, that, you know, a big guy, but imagine if you were a traffic cop and you pulled somebody over for having a busted taillight, and then in the back of the car, you saw a bunch of, like, paintings that were stolen that you saw on, like, you know, BuzzFeed or Instagram were stolen. And you said to yourself, Oh, like, I'm just the traffic cop. I'm here to, like, give a traffic ticket. <clears throat> that would be technically okay, but you really should, like, refer that on to, like, a different department, and you didn't. And he really understood that, and he went in front of the Bundesrat, which is the, I guess I'm doing the five-minute version of this. Um, he went, Balsbach, the attorney general, went in front of the Bundesrat, which is the, the high seat of parliament, so sort of like our Senate, and said, like, we really need to change this. Like, technically what's going on is legal, but it's not really moral, and we need to change it. And coming from a legal head, that was really influential, but it was just dead in the water. To answer your question about why, that's something I've thought about a lot. Um, the constituents don't really care. Um, I mean, they care, but not enough to change their vote. And also, these people who are in power get a lot of their influence from people who frankly may have a lot of this type of artwork. Well, and, that's what I was wondering. If yeah. Like, well. 
the fail the thing is the yeah the fails first so the statute of limitations only applies to individuals and private collections and it does not apply to government collections and there has been an interesting lack of investigation into private collections and while I see Germans are very into Datenschutz, which is data protection, which I completely understand. I mean, I get very annoyed when somebody even gives my cell phone out to somebody else. I don't even have Facebook. But at the same time, if you're getting a tax break by showing off your private collection in a public museum, maybe we should be looking into the origins of that mm -hmm. collection. Mm -hmm. So I hope that, does that answer your mm -hmm. question? Yeah. It, it sounds like there's a yeah, I think follow the, follow the money is kind of the key thing here. You two looked like you had a question. You just like backed up. I, well, we have time for one more before yeah. uh, Mary has cell phone books, right. but go right ahead. Um, I do have a question. So my yeah. sister and I are going to Berlin in March, um, and she works in a gallery in Chelsea. She loves <clears> art. So I'm wondering what It's museum, a great city, I'm um, scared. No, wait, I've never been. I'm excited to go. I'm wondering if there's any museums you could recommend that, you know, if I Google it, they wouldn't come up right away, but they're worth checking out. Oh, yeah, that's easy, our... actually. And I think you had a question. Did you have a question? Pink shirt lady? Pink yeah. yeah. shirt lady. Um, I have a few questions, but what's I was curious. Um, oh, do you want to answer? I'll answer him and I'll answer it. Yeah. Okay. That's an easy one. Um, Museum Beck one. Uh, so that's B E. I can give you my email if you want like a list of places to go. Because I have them right now already. Um, B E R G R U E N. Um, it's a German guy. It's next to the Schloss Schadenburg, which is also it's a palace. Oh. Yeah, the last room has a, a, a sculpture of a hideous child. God love him. Um, but so hideous. Um, uh, but um, it's okay. I was a hideous child. Um, but uh, no, um, that would be what I say is the best. It's a museum uh, by um, the Big One family. They're a Jewish, French, American family. Um, and it has an insane number of works on paper by Picasso, Matisse. Um, works on paper are great. Uh, it's pretty cheap. Uh, they have an excellent bar across the street and restaurant. <coughs> Um, and it's super underrated, and it's my favorite museum in Berlin. Thank you. And it's works on paper, which are totally mm -hmm. taken for granted. And I, I'll get to you in a second, and then it's yes, mm -hmm. I was curious how many works the father had originally, how many he sold. Oh, okay. Um, originally, I mean, we don't know the precise figures, because he didn't leave papers, mm -hmm. but originally we're talking about, yeah, and I, you know, I kind of go up to the nearest number, about 1,400. Mm -hmm. And then the son and daughter sold uh, several works over um, their lifetimes after he, the father died in 1956. They sold works for, um, I mean, they lived quite frugally, relatively speaking. Um, but they could sell works for about $20,000, mm -hmm. Euro, I mean, Reichs, I mean, depending on the name, Reichs, Marx, or Jersey dollars, but twenty to thirty thousand dollars, depending on the currency. Um, they would sell them at cheap for that, or at more for about three hundred thousand, um, and and live off of that. So. so, what were they planning on doing with these? Were they trying to sell them all? They no, trying? they weren't. I, I, um, I think we talk about it in chapter eight maybe chapter seven, but Cornelius Gurlitt had a sister, Benita, and then the father was Hildebrand, and the, the siblings, Cornelius felt very much like it was his duty to protect his father's legacy, mm -hmm. um, but his sister, she sort of, she was willing to use the money, but not engage with it directly, um, and she ended up getting married, um, uh, Cornelius did not, but they developed, I mean, I think, uh, I hate Lord of the Rings, uh, so I'm blanking on the name, but they developed a sort of hoarded, 
supporting aspect around these works um, where they felt like they needed to protect them to protect their father's legacy. Mm -hmm. um, and that essentially um, directed a lot of their lives. Um, there is a letter that we talk about in the book where you know the father has died and, and left um, the works to Hildebrand and his sister writes uh, Hildebrand and just says, this seems like a curse that we have to deal with this for the rest of our lives. Like it's the late 1950s, and I'm not going to be dealing with this until the 90s. And that, you know, I, mean, I guess we all deal with like parental baggage. But getting 1,300 works of art from like Nazi looted uh, programs is a bit of a thing. Um, so they dealt with it in very different ways. She retreated from it and sort of tried to deny it. Um, while at the same time living off of it. And then he um, he would, you know, we talk about in the book, he wouldn't have friends, he didn't have a girlfriend, he didn't have a partner, he kept the shutters down, and very much treated these artworks as his children in a way. Mm. So, does that answer? Mm. Yeah. It's precious. And then, I think just, yeah, whatever that thing is for Lord of the Rings. It's precious, the yeah. is precious. Yeah, I think this has president in Austria. It does. Um, there was a work stolen from a Jewish family in Germany, and the family member found it hanging in the museum in Vienna. And it took an American attorney and many years. But the louder the noise, the more afraid they were to keep it. But they wanted it. They did not want to give it up. Yeah, are you talking about uh, Lady in Gold? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Um, so, as you'll see, um, shameless sales point, um, the top uh, endorsement I have in my book is actually Amory O'Connor, who covered that story. Yes, it is. Um, uh, that was a painting, uh, that's an interesting legal case, too. Um, you can tell I'm an art legal wonk. Um, but, uh, yes, so the first quote on the back of my book is from Ian, uh, who was an excellent champion of my book. Um, you would be surprised how I find that women in journalism tend to try to undercut other women more than men try to undercut women. Um, but Anne was great. Um, so she wrote about this. So if anyone aren't, if anyone's not familiar, uh, it was a painting with Gustav Klimt um, of a Del called The Woman in Gold. It was actually hanging in an Austrian museum. Um, but it was the first Supreme Court case uh, where the Supreme Court ruled on an American case against a foreign government. Um, so it was um, Baldwin versus the Republic of Austria. Um, and that was in either the late 90s or early 2000s. I'm going to try to remember if I can't remember. Anyway, um, that was a case that was a precedent for this um, where um, Essentially, the Blochbauer family, um, the, the husband of the woman in the painting, uh, she, this is an insanely paraphrasing an incredibly complex legal situation, but um, she left the work to the Austrian government with the uh, caveat that her husband could amend her will. Her husband fled Austria to Switzerland. Uh, because he was Jewish, he was told that in order to amend the will, he would have to come back to Austria, which obviously would mean that he was deported. Um, he ended up dying uh, abroad. Um, and then she, many, many, many years later, um, was named in the will as the heir, you know, if he hadn't revoked the the Austrian government getting it, they obstructed situations that would have allowed her to get it within a certain statute of limitations, and the Supreme Court heard the case, um, and she received the work back. Um, and I think it was, was it Scalia? I can't remember, but I think it was Scalia who wrote, like, the major opinion on it. But, um, that was, yeah, that was a situation where it did end up going through the court system um, here in America. I mean, that's very rare. That's something that legally is incredibly 
Uh, I mean, Anne Marie's book is amazing. Everyone should also read it. Um, but uh, legally, it's very complicated when you deal with statute of limitations, jurisdictions, where you file things, if you have a right to file things in a certain country when you're not a citizen anymore, the exposure you might have by becoming a citizen of a country where you technically have the right to be a citizen. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but yes, that is a success story, but it's a rare one. One thing I talk about in the epilogue <coughs> by the book um, <laughs> is um, that I, so the first two exhibitions of a lot of these works were, I mean, I had access to a lot of like documents about the works and records about the books, like from sources of mine. But the first really public exhibition of these works um, was a joint exhibition held uh, in 2018 called Status Report Gurlitt. Um, and it was, and Status Report, like in German, it sort of vaguely is like their version of like State of the Union. So it's like a really like reckoning of. And um, there was an exhibition in Bonn, which is the West German former capital. And then there was an exhibition in Bern, which is the Swiss capital of, of what's the capital of Switzerland? Um, and that currently holds the work, and there were concurrent exhibitions. And they were of these works, and I remember going to both exhibitions, and they had um, the provenance on these little cards in English and German on next to each work. And so the provenance, like we talked about earlier, is the list of everyone who's ever owned the work from the minute it was made to currently. And it really struck me being the nosy little yeah that I am sorry I'm not like a sailor um, but it really struck me as, as interesting that in several of the works um, it said at the end private collection southern Germany and I, I remember calling the head of the exhibition and saying Hi, you know, we had an interview. Um, so I, I, I called him and asked him a bunch of questions, but then I also said, so, you know, what, coming back to your point about who gets the money, any time a work of art, whether it's, you know, it doesn't matter what kind of work of art, whether it's this or something you own here in the room, any time it's ever in a museum, it increases the value of the work. So not only, when you, if you ever want to sell the work, think about like a resume. You not only have like where every single work has been from the beginning of it's being created, you can also say any time a work has been cited in a book, and then you can say any time a work has been displayed. And that will always, almost always without fail, increase the value of the work. And because this great museum thinks your piece is great, you know, just like, you know, you guys think I'm worth coming to talk to on a Friday night, like about Hitler, so clearly my book isn't horrible, hopefully. Um, but anyway, I remember asking the museum director, and I said, so you've upped the value of these works, and it says Southern Germany by descent from, from Hildebrand Gerlitt, they belong to the widower of, you know, Hildebrand Gerlitt. So Cornelius Gerlitt's sister owns these works and, and, and passed them on to her husband, and you're increasing the value. And he was like, yeah, well, and I was like, you don't deny that they increased the value. Like, I'm an art market reporter. Like, I follow the money, first and foremost. And he was like, yeah, but, you know, we're, we're not really dealing with that. Like, if, if it's illegal for him to have, and I said it, you know, I was like, if, if these works are looted, what are you going to do to get them back to somebody? Because you haven't changed the laws. Like, I, I would have to look up the actual codified number. But I was like, law, X, Y, Z, one, two, three, you know says that he can keep them, even if they're looted. And he was like, well, it's not really a problem. And I was like, isn't it though? Because you're taxpayer funded. And then it was like, oh, go to the finance ministry. And the finance ministry says, go to the culture ministry. And the culture ministry says, go back to the art guy. So it ups the value of the works by being in these exhibitions, but there's really not a time being done to change that. And again, I, I feel very conflicted saying that because there's so many things I love about America. I, ever since I got married, I've been spending more time in America. And there are so many great things about America, but, and there's so many great things about Germany, but that's definitely something that Germany, 
I think really needs to fix because they're upping the value of these artworks without really going through a clear provenance system. Okay. Anything else? They're about to flee the prison. Very, thank you.